today I've got Lou from Tropic Marin here who is going to help us get to the bottom of uh, why, when, and how you'd want to ever dose phosphates, which almost feels counterintuitive because most of the time we're talking about how to reduce phosphates or at least control phosphates. So I'm gonna start with the obvious question. Uh, when would someone want to add phosphates to their tank? I mean, obviously if it's testing critically low, but like when in your reefing journey, is it most appropriate to even look at dosing phosphates? Hmm, right from the start. <laughs> right from the, immediately if not before. Yeah, uh, because even when your tank is cycling, those animals need phosphates in order to be healthy and cycle the tank properly. So you want to make sure that you've got adequate phosphates in the water column and in the system right from the get-go. Otherwise, that, I know that's not stunted. the answer you wanted, but no. that's the true answer. No, that's a good answer because I think it's something that I, like not even I really consider is that when you're starting up this tank and you've all you have is sand and rock in there and you're trying to get things going, eventually phosphates are gonna end up in the system and that's because things require phosphates. The food we put in puts in phosphates mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but that happens eventually. And if we're trying to get a system started and it's devoid of phosphate, that's gotta have repercussions or at least make it more difficult. There you go, Fos start. All right, okay, okay. I mean, I the, should, whole I should reason, seen that coming. the whole reason this product exists is because the biome that you're trying to create, the bacteria that you're trying to foster when you're cycling a tank need phosphate. So Fos start goes in the tank right in the beginning as you're actually cycling that system for the very first time so that you can create that biome properly and those, those animals can thrive. Okay, so. I'm gonna ask the hard question. How is this different from chucking a piece of shrimp in my tank or well, from, adding ammonium or something like that to try to start feeding bacteria? Like, why, why would I turn to a phosphate specific product instead of going the route that most people on the internet think is the best route? Well, uh, a piece of shrimp thrown in the tank is not gonna give you the phosphates. It's gonna give you the proteins. Right. But it's not gonna give you the phosphate. Okay. It's going to end up giving you nitrates after all the whole nitrogen cycle, but it's not going to give you the phosphates. So, and and I, I got that's funny... actually super important. <laughs> so we're not just trying to this critical. It's so funny that in retrospect these things seem obvious to me. So when we're starting a tank, we shouldn't just be trying to get the nitrogen cycle going. That is an important component, but having the nitrogen cycle complete doesn't mean that what you put in the tank is gonna have what it needs to start thriving immediately. The phosphates is gonna help your nitrogen cycle get going as well. Continue. Well, th all those animals need phosphate to grow. The entire microbiome. Yeah. So um, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I once had a tank, a 150 tank that I was trying to cycle and um, I couldn't get it going. I just could not get it going. <laughs> And you talk about uh, throwing a piece of shrimp in there. Yeah. Um, but this was a 150. So shrimp wasn't enough. No, a whole bucket. <laughs> so no, what I did was I went to the local fishmonger and I got the uh, rack from a salmon. Okay, With sure. the head and yep. the spine and everything. And I threw the whole thing in there. Holy crap. And it did an amazingly great job of cycling the tank. But boy, it stunk for a few <laughs> weeks pretty badly. <laughs> now, maybe if I'd had some more phosphate in there, it would have been cycling a little bit easier. But right on. The <laughs> the totally unrelated story. But I love that um, story though. Well, but when you said shrimp, it made me think about that. Um, but phos start is so that you're supplying those phosphates to those animals right from day one. Now, once that tank cycles, and then you start putting vertebrates and invertebrates in, then you switch over to the phosphate, if your phosphate level is still low. Okay. All right, um, but again, the important factor here with these two products, I see these products, I separate these, right? Psh, I separate them because I think that these two products represent something unique. They represent a completely new approach to tank nutrition. And, and tank maintenance. Okay. 
And I'll tell you why. There's two big reasons. One is that we talked in another video about how the coral polyps need a particulate undissolved phosphate to absorb the phosphate right. well. So the phosphate that you're reading on your test kit is not very easy for the corals to access. It's actually pretty difficult, pretty difficult. for them to access. So we need a way to package it so that they can actually get it and you were saying that's and that's what carbon dosing yeah, does. Per, a particulate form is the way. So either in a bacteria yep. or um, in the form of like rain down uh, fish feces as they go over the reef. Okay. Exactly. So, so yeah. So this is uh, these products are undissolved and undissolvable particulate phosphate. So when you add phosphate or phosphate, and we'll talk about phosphate because we're into that part of the tank now, um, you're, you're adding particulate phosphate to the tank that's not going to dissolve. Um, and then people say, well, I don't see my phosphate level go up. Well, you actually do see it go up because then the bacteria isn't taking as much out of the water column. So eventually you see the phosphate level go up a little bit, but it's not a direct result of putting I in was this just undissolved ask, phosphate. So when you put in undissolved phosphate, that will be in the tank. It will be usable by other organisms, which means the uh, dissolved phosphate will separately start to go up because those organisms are using the easier to access phosphate versus the harder to access right. phosphate. Right, and the corals can take it directly from this. Okay. okay. Um, so that's, that's one reason this is unique, is that it's a whole new way to look at giving those coral polyps nutrition um, or the chemicals that they need. Maybe we don't want to talk about phosphate as specifically nutrition, um, but it's a compound that they need and we're, we're giving it to them in an undissolved particulate form. But here's the other thing that I think make these important in the evolution that we're undergoing of chemical additions and, and uh, supplementations in, in reef systems. If you look at the nitrate and phosphate on a coral reef, particularly the phosphate, it's close to zero. Now we know that those coral polyps have to have phosphate in order to thrive. Corals have been thriving for hundreds of thousands of years, growing like weeds, taking over, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of, of coral reefs at almost zero phosphate in the water column. So how are they getting it? They're getting it from the fish feces and the fish poop. Uh, big Antheus school comes by or Heniochus comes by, poops all over the reef, and all those polyps now get that particulate phosphate. But there's another thing going on that I think, and this is my own theory that is just based in absolutely nothing, but <laughs> this is what I think we're gonna find out someday. There's another factor here, which is that this coral polyp is existing in this aqueous solution of almost zero phosphate. Now the fish come by, they poop all over the reef and there's tons of phosphate for this coral polyp to absorb. Then in a few minutes, it goes back to zero again. There's this pulsing of nutrients that happens. And I think, with absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever, but I am of the opinion that this pulsing of nutrients is gonna prove to be crucial to the mechanisms that corals have for uptaking those nutrients. Now think about what do we do in our reef tanks? In our reef tanks, we're always trying to keep the nutrients at a perfectly even level. This is exactly opposite from what happens on a natural coral reef. One minute they've got more phosphates than they know what to do with, and the next minute they've got almost zero phosphates. So I think that we're going to find that this, there's a pulsing of nutrients that will help the polyps absorb their nutrients, not just with phosphate, um, but with other things as well. And um, I'm, of the opinion that this is the, these are the first two products of many, and, and keep in mind, I have no inside information that we're working on any other products that do this pulsing or whatever, but I think that we're gonna find that it's an important factor that comes into play in other nutrient absorption. That is a really interesting idea. It, it, it kind of reminds me of, um, like when you cut down a tree and you see the rings on a tree, mm -hmm. and you can see the seasons yeah. based on what was available. 
Well, there are seasons in the ocean. There are algal blooms and, and uh, parts of the year in certain areas of the ocean where you have these huge swells of um, zooplankton and phytoplankton, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they go away. It wouldn't shock me to find out that similar mechanisms on like a smaller or faster scale would happen on a reef and that there are biological mechanisms that corals would have come up with to take advantage. Okay, right now is a nutrient absorbing time. We're gonna take everything we can and yeah. now is a nutrient using time. We can't absorb anymore. We're gonna use what we've stored up and do something with it. And then that might fluctuate. That's a I, very interesting. I idea. think I've got a convert over here. He's going to be. He's going to be part of my disciples with this I just, pulsing nutrients. Look, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm always open to uh, an idea of of new information and and a new way of looking at things or experimenting with things, and it fascinates me. I'm not saying I'm converted yet, <laughs> but we'll get him there. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, but, the, but the idea is really interesting, and I don't think it's outlandish by any uh, any means. I think that could make a lot of sense. So how um, how would you propose then using like, phos I'm guessing phosphine would probably be the one you'd be using to do that. I I is that? In the long run, in the beginning, when you're starting a tank and cycling, use the phos start. Right, and then once you've got like your corals and your fish and stuff in there, the phos feed is how you're going to help uh, do those nutrient or load them up with phosphate. What, what would Lou's recommendation for, um, using this like what would that look like on a weekly basis or even monthly basis i don't know you mean as far as dosing instructions yes exactly you uh follow the instructions because i don't know what they are <laughs> you know what that's that's totally yeah. fair so would this then replace like you would do this with carbon dosing still or would you do this instead of carbon dosing is this a secondary option is this do it as well is this so that's a really interesting question, and here's why. Phos start is actually phos feed with the addition of reef active in it. That's so funny. So with the phos start, what you're doing is, is you're doing the carbon dosing okay. for the bacteria at the same time that you're giving that phosphate that they need. Okay, so... And this this is a combination of making sure there's enough phosphate in the system for the entire microbiome, as well as promoting a healthy uh, portion of microbiome by saying this this carbon loving bacteria that we know is going to do a good job. We're going to add that at the same time. Mm, you're not actually adding the bacteria. You're adding the food for the bacteria yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. promotes that growth. Yeah, I misspoke. That's that's true. So, but but that's what essentially you're doing with that. You're like, here's the phosphate. Also, let's feed the bacteria that we want to promote in the system. Yeah. Okay. Now, people then naturally, the next question is, well, why don't we just continue with the phos start? Because then we're doing carbon dosing yeah. and doing the um the phosphate addition at the same time. Right. The answer to that is that it's a very different proportion in here. So you wanna stick with this for the cycling of the tank, but once the tank is fully cycled, then you go over to the phosphate. Then when you start adding animals to the tank and you wanna do carbon dosing, that's when you go over and add the refact teeth to it. And if you follow both of those instructions, the phosphate and the refact teeth, you're gonna be in a very different proportion than you are in the FOSS start. Okay, perfect. So w would you also be able to use this alongside something like uh, NP back to balance? Oh, 100%, absolutely. Okay. And they won't conflict, they won't be like overloading? No, because the NP back to balance um, is, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it's a different form of phosphate that you're adding. Gotcha. So um, this is that, undissolved particulate phosphate, where with the NP back to balance, you're adding a phosphate for the bacteria to pick up. With the phosphate, you're adding a, a phosphate for the coral polyp to directly pick up. Okay, so um, like we were talking about in uh, the other video where we were discussing NP back to balance and carbon dosing, you're using carbon dosing to take that phosphate, put it into like a little cheeseburger that the coral can actually use. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and consume. This is just cheeseburgers. Correct. This is already in a form that they're going to be able to love. Correct. Awesome. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So um, would you, I'm going to get back to some basic questions. 
let's say my phosphate is too high. Mm -hmm. Would I still want to use something like this? If my phosphate's already, like the phosphate you can test for, because this is in a different form. Would I want to continue using um, something like this if my phosphates are too high while I'm trying to battle that? Are they completely separate? Um, they're mostly separate, but I would say deal with the phosphate concentration first. Part of that's gonna depend on how high the phosphate level is. If your phosphate level is ridiculously high, you're at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 like PPM. Like that's critically high. You know, yeah. that's really, really high. I wouldn't wanna see any more phosphate going into that system, particulate right. or not, yeah. right? Um, if it's a little high, it's 0 0.2, you probably could get away with it, but the approach that makes more sense to me would be to do the carbon dosing get that phosphate level down to a reasonable level to the, the range you'd like, then go to the phosphate. Gotcha. Okay. You could probably get away with it if that phosphate level was at a reasonably high, like 0.2, something like that. Right. You know, but I still think that the better approach would be use the carbon dosing, the Alima NP, get that phosphate down, and then use your, your phosphate. Okay, so that makes sense. On the inverse, if your phosphate's really low, mm -hmm. like on a test kit, you're barely showing up if you're lucky. You immediately. Immediately start using this. Immediately, because this is gonna give your phosphates directly to your coral polyps that they don't have, that they can't even get from the bacteria because the bacteria can't get it out of the water column because it's not in the water column. So, okay. Can you run near zero phosphates and then just do something like this to make sure the corals are getting what they need? In theory, yes. Okay, because if I'm like putting things together correctly here, some people do like running ultra low nutrient systems. I find it insanely difficult to mm -hmm. do. Um, so I try not to do it. I've had very poor luck with it because yeah. it's so hard to balance coral nutrition at that point and make sure they get what they need. But in theory, if you wanted to run an ultra low nutrient system, you could make sure your corals are still getting what they need and essentially prevent algae that is gonna use a lot of that liquid phosphate or that dissolved phosphate that's in the water by just feeding this. I would take your statement one step further. Okay, go for it. And I would say that if you wanna run an ultra low nutrient system, a product like Phosfeed is essential to keep your corals healthy. It's not just can you, if you're, I, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think that, I think the ultra and low nutrient system craze is pretty much gone. Yes. Um, but for those that still want to run extremely low nutrient, maybe there's an extremely low nutrient uh, movement at this point, I think Phosfeed is the only way to do it to keep your corals healthy because this doesn't show up in your water column, right? keeps your phosphate level low, but still gives your corals the phosphates they need. Your phosphate, your corals can live in a zero nitrate environment and still be happy because they're not getting their nitrogen compounds from nitrate. They're getting it from urea or ammonium. They can't live in a zero phosphate environment if there's no phosphate supply other than the water column. Phosphate can do that. So I would, I would take that statement and say, if you wanna run an ultra low nutrient system, phosphate is, a, uh, phosphate is essential to, getting, to keeping those corals healthy. I, I would even say, there, I know there's a lot of people who, um, I think it's more and more common, I'll start with this, it's more and more common for people to run into issues with not having enough nutrients because of how good filtration has gotten. Yeah, especially with uh, algae scrubbers and it's incredible. refugiums. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, when I started reefing, the issue was keeping things down. Yep. The issue is no longer keeping things down for a lot of people, it's keeping them where they need to be and not getting too high or too low. But I, I would say there's a lot of people who are in this position where they're having a hard time keeping it up mm -hmm. and they are nervous, beyond nervous, to dose anything to get it up because they are afraid of the repercussions in forms of like uh, dinos, um, cyanobacteria, uh, hair algae. Yeah. If you're in that camp where you're, you're running low nutrients, you're having a hard time getting your corals what they need, which I also wanna to touch on in your, your opinion in a sec, what that would look like, what corals look like when they need phosphates. 
um, because you probably have more experience than I do. But um, this is a really great solution to not having to turn around and dose phosphate and nitrate if you are nervous to do that. Instead of trying to bring those levels up because you don't want to end up fueling something you don't want to have, this, is a, this sounds like the perfect way to make sure that your corals are going to get what they need uh, and avoid that problem entirely, which sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, as I said, it represents a whole new approach to nutrient supply. And um, this allows you to keep a lower phosphate level in your water column, but still ensuring that your corals are getting the phosphates that they need. That's perfect. So on that note, how do you know when your, your corals are not getting the phosphate that they need? It's really hard to know. Um, okay. If your phosphate level in your water column is low, and you're not doing carbon dosing, and you're not using phosphate, it's almost certain that your corals are not getting the phosphates they need. How would that, how would that manifest in a coral? Like if I'm looking at my tank and I'm like, I know things aren't what they, like what I would like to see out of them. And I know some corals are more sensitive than others, mm -hmm. but like what, what does a coral lacking phosphate look like? I don't know. Just failure to thrive kind of thing? Um, I, I think it's different for different corals and different systems. Okay. Because there's other factors that may influence how that low phosphate level affects your corals. Um, and I think maybe a zoa is going to react differently than an elegance that's going to react differently than a, Montecora. you know, Ghani or a Monty. Or, okay. um, so I, I don't have a, a, a fixed answer to that. Um, but I can tell you this, once a coral, this is, this is a, a, one of the, the most common things that I talk to aquarists about. Once your coral starts to look unhappy, it's already too late. It's already starving for it's something. Already, it's already in big trouble. Uh, and if your coral is looking unhappy, the thing that's making it unhappy probably started weeks ago. It didn't start yesterday. Yeah. There's very little that we do to a reef tank that makes our corals unhappy overnight. Those, those are big things. Those are huge temperature swings, huge alkalinity swings, huge uh, pH swings. That's catastrophic stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah. Not, I'm, that's not a husbandry issue so much as just a catastrophic event. Yeah. So, you're right. I've, I've seen very few corals go downhill in less than, like, me being able to notice, less than a couple of weeks. Usually, yeah. if something's going wrong, actually, on the note of zoanthids, when I started uh, the reef that I still have now, which is upstairs, it's not in here. Um, We're going uh, up to see that in a minute, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I put a bunch of corals in there right off the get-go. And uh, my phosphates and my nitrates were low. And mm -hmm. I wasn't really, I've done this so many times that sometimes I just don't think about it and I run with it. I got a life, right? So sometimes I'm not paying attention. <laughs> I wasn't testing nitrate and phosphate and my zoanthids within two weeks went from being big, happy zoanthids to being very small, mm -hmm. sometimes not opening at all, like literally the polyp not opening and getting pale. And I was like, what is going on? And I, for some reason, couldn't put two and two together. So I asked a friend of mine, sent him a picture, and he said, test your nutrients. Phosphate and nitrate were at zero. The second I started um, feeding the corals, like paying attention to what they were getting, I, I started adding uh, aminos. I was dosing phosphate and nitrate to the system, and I was feeding the fish a heck of a lot more just to try to get the nutrients up. Immediately, they started to turn around. Two weeks later, they were back to looking the way they should. So... That is the fastest turnaround that yep. I've seen. I have not seen a coral, unless it's a catastrophic event, I've yeah. not seen a coral show uh, like a lack of nutrition faster than that. So it is something that does take time. But I guess on that note, I would say if, if, if your tank is not thriving, if you're not getting the kind of growth you'd expect, mm -hmm. if your corals are starting to look worse rather than better, if they were growing and stop, that's a really big indication that something's kind of not right, then maybe it's time to start looking into your nutrients and then approaching it. By the sounds of it, we should just be using this anyway. But um, 
I know a lot of people are in the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And I 100% agree. But if something starts to get broke and you can't put your finger on it and you're testing See, I don't things, agree with that. <gasps> okay. I don't agree with that. If you take, if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude with corals, you react too late. That is fair. If you wait until it's broken, you're going to lose corals. Um, it's part of the reason you do testing on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, I'm not one of these people who say you have to test every week, everything every week. I, that's not the case. But you do need to do regular testing at least once a month. And if something is not feeling right or looking right or you get a test result that doesn't make sense or whatever, then you need to go to more uh, uh, reactive testing more often to make sure you can figure that out. But I think if you, if you take a wait and see attitude, by the time those corals are showing a problem, by the time that polyp extension is retracted, by the time they're not putting those, feeder, those feeders out at night, it's too late. You've already, you've already gotten a much bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. Like you definitely don't want to be lackadaisical. Um, I think it's just like, if you've got a regime, uh, that works for you. You've mm -hmm. got a maintenance schedule that works. You're getting growth. Things are going well, and you don't want to start using a new product for the sake of trying it out. I would do it anyway, personally. <laughs> I, I love exploring new things, but not like some people would rather just be like, I know what I'm doing. This is working for me. I don't want to mess with a good thing. Don't mess with a good thing. That's fine. But if that ever changes and you have to figure out a problem because all of a sudden something's not working, a test is not going right, and you want to uh, pinpoint it down and everything else looks normal and you just can't figure it out. Finding out that nutrition can be delivered to a coral in a different way, much more effectively, is a great option to have, to have that tool. And the funny thing about this hobby that I found um, is that it's a, it's a big ship that likes to steer very slowly. It is so reluctant to take on new approaches to things, which I think is a darn shame because it's my favorite thing to do. I love finding out uh, new avenues to explore and new ways to approach things and when we get new information and to be able to apply it and see a really great result. So I, I really do hope to see a lot of people taking advantage of this because the science sounds really good to me and that makes it a very promising. I'm I'm telling you right now, <laughs> I'm gonna start using this effectively it's also, immediately. You know, it's also, um, when, when you look at your reef tank, you don't know, it, it, people call me and they say, oh, my, my tank is doing great, but do I need to do this or that? You don't know if that tank doing great is, is that a five on a scale of one to 10? Or is it an eight? Um, if I did this, would it change that number? So sometimes it's good to try some new things and see how your corals react. Yeah, You'll know within a week or two if those corals like that or don't like that. And it's it's worth sometimes trying new things and seeing you your tank might go from a seven to an eight. All of a sudden things are looking a little bit better. You thought it was looking as, as you know, the best it possibly could, but then you find out, no, uh, it actually could look a little better than that. Or maybe it backs off a little bit. Maybe it didn't like that thing that you tried and then you get rid of it. So I think it's a good idea to try new things from time to time, especially in a well-established system. Because um, it, I have this discussion with people about water changes all the time. I'm of the opinion, um, and you hear, you hear me say this all the time because um, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm not a chemist. Um, and you know, I started in a hobby with a reef tank, you know, just like everybody else. So you just, you just don't know. But I am of the opinion that the compounds in a saltwater system don't stay in the same molecular form forever. And this is part of the reason you do water changes. And um, people always, you know, ask me about the water change thing because I'm a salt guy, you know. So of course. They always ask me about water changes. I know that when I had my reef system, there was almost nothing that was 100% consistent. Almost nothing. But there was one thing that was 100% consistent, which was every single time I did a water change, those animals looked better the next day. 
100% of the time. And in my book, in my reef keeping book, if there's a button that I can push that makes my animals look better the next day, I probably should push that button once in a while. Absolutely. And that's always my answer to people about water changes. They say, oh, I never do water changes, my tank looks great. Do a water change, see what your tank looks like the next day. If it looks better, probably means you should do a water change once in a while. Absolutely. You know? And I think a, pro a product like Phosphid, especially if you're running an ultra low nutrient system or an extremely low nutrient system, goes under the same thing. Give it a try and see what it looks like in the next week or two. And if those animals look better, it means you're giving them something that they needed that they didn't have before. And the best part is it's a super low risk <laughs> addition. Yeah. It's not like you're swapping. It's not like something drastic, like going from sand bed to bare bottom. It is not a big change. It is give it a shot. If it works, you get results. Perfect. If not, it's just as easy to stop, like no harm, no foul, Yeah. which is really great because there's not a lot of things in reef keeping where that you can do that sort of thing. Actually, one other thing that you can do um, that I think uh, along the lines of getting the ship to steer that took a while for some other people to get on board with was amino acids. Yeah, totally. For, for a long time, like we dosed like um, uh, marine snow or zooplankton or phytoplankton. That was it. That was coral nutrition. Maybe I'd sprinkle in a powdered food or like try to give my uh, polyps some uh, daphnia or cyclopes or something like that. And then we started seeing amino acids hit and people questioning, do I need that? Should I use it? And eventually as people started to get on board with it and documenting what was happening, you'd see that there was a, an actual tangible result from dosing amino acids from uh, puffier uh, tissue to um, having better coloration. So, and I think we have one up here, don't we? Yeah, yeah. amino organic. So here's, here is my question. Um, if I'm already dosing amino acids, how important is it to also be dosing, uh, is there crossover basically between dosing a phosphate? Uh, okay, so they're completely, okay, so explain to me, explain, explain how they are different and um, I guess the merits of also doing amino acids if you're doing this and vice versa. Well, the merits of doing amino acids have nothing to do at all with the phosphate. Okay. Uh, it's two completely different things. The phosphate is used in the metabolism of the coral, at certain enzymatic activities. It's a whole different thing. The so, corals are not going to be happy if they don't have the phosphate that they need. So this is like bare uh, cellular function, like the, the absolute bottom of the basic. Like you have to have this. For metabolism. Yes. Like this is required. Right. I cannot survive without this. The amino acids... Um, the simplest way to think of amino acids is that you're trying to grow a coral reef. Yes. Okay. And you have to build those proteins to build coral flesh. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So okay. to think of it in a, and, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but um, as I said, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist. So I need oversimplification to be able to understand things. 100%. <laughs> and when, when tissue grows, you're, you're, you're building those proteins, and those proteins are made up of amino acids. And you're going to get certain amino acids from some of the foods that the, that the corals will eat, um, but they don't always get what they need. So when you're dosing amino acids, you're directly giving those corals the building blocks that they need in order to grow. Okay, so the way my brain's uh, understanding this, maybe it's the same way you guys are understanding it. Um, phosphate, basic requirement for a coral to function. If mm -hmm. it doesn't have phosphate, it can't do anything properly. Well, it can do some things, but there's many but this this will like life threatening things that it can't do exactly. So like without a, coral, the a coral cannot survive if it's not getting phosphate. Right. Coral cannot grow tissue if it's not getting amino acids. Right. And it will get amino acids from other places, but it's not going to get all the aminos that it needs. And so dosing amino acids is a way to give those corals the the building blocks that they need to um, to be able to grow. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So. Basically, you need to have both. There, it's not like a one or the other. It, it's not like one of these is coral nutrition, the other isn't. They are both almost separate parts 
of making sure that you're approaching coral health holistically. Exactly. So like, for instance, even if I was using both of these, I would still be target feeding my LPS. Like I'm still going mm -hmm. to, if it's got tentacles in a mouth and it wants food, I'm gonna do that, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna stop doing this because I can't guarantee that the foods that I'm even feeding are the whole picture. I can't guarantee right. that they're getting everything they need from what I'm able to give them. Whereas I can make sure they're gonna get enough phosphate yep. and I can make sure they're gonna get enough of the right kinds of aminos to continue growing. So that makes, when you think things are gonna get simpler, <laughs> um, you find out that they're not, they're not necessarily more complicated, but it's really good. Like I find it very reassuring to know that I am able to apply what my corals need and see them adapt to it and grow and thrive. What gives me anxiety with reef keeping is not knowing about certain uh, aspects of coral health or not being able to meet them and having random, like unforeseen mortality. And I think that, you know, I'm gonna bring this back to a point that we made before, which is try it. Try the amino acids, see how your corals react to that. When you see the, the health of the coral, when you see the polyp extension and how much engorged they get and their color, um, you're going to realize that you're, you're supplying something with the amino acids that they weren't getting before. A hundred percent. And I can say firsthand, having uh, gone from not using amino acids to using amino acids, once I started using them, I never turned back. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much. Like, you don't have to take our word for it. Search <laughs> amino acids and corals on YouTube or anywhere, and you will see other people's journeys of, I'm not using amino acids, I'm gonna start. And then seeing how much changes in just a matter of weeks is kind of mind blowing. I have a feeling we're gonna see similar kinds of experiences when we start using uh, phosphate that's in this particulate I, I, form. Yeah, I agree, especially because, you know, some of you mentioned before where Back in the day, we all fought with getting our nutrient levels down. And now with algae scrubbers and refugiums and keto and the refugiums and all of that, um, the trend now is trying to get those phosphate and nitrate levels up. And uh, when you start supplying phosphate in the direct form that the corals need it to absorb it, that's a whole game changer. I can't wait. I'm not gonna lie, my tank is not in the best condition right now. And I've got a very specific reason for that. Uh, our studio is in the, the space it had previously been in. Um, some of you may or may not know, my basement had flooded and I had to move everything upstairs, including my reef tank. That's the only thing that hasn't come back down and now I don't work next to it. So I don't pay as much attention to it as I used to. And I'm starting to have issues because I've been overcompensating with feeding my fish as a form of trying to get more nutrients into the system. And I have got cyano and all kinds of problems. You need that reef tank right here. I know, or at least right here. <laughs> no, right, right the here. The worst part so is I've got- always see it. <laughs> right, and I've got two empty tanks. Like yes. there's no excuse. No. But um, I, I'm looking forward to switching my approach from trying to add phosphates in liquid form mm -hmm. and add phosphates through feeding fish. You'll see the difference. To doing something like this. Um, and I, I might just have to document that to make sure that uh, I have some results that I can show everybody. I'm super excited about this. And we've discussed a lot in terms of coral nutrition through the exploration of uh, phosphate and amino acids. But on the topic of feeding fish, because that is something I could definitely improve on. I would love to uh, know more about this bass leer fish foods. I have heard good things. I don't quite understand them all. <laughs> And since you're here, I'm gonna pick your brain. But you guys are gonna to have to follow us on that conversation in this video that's coming up. Uh, Lou's gonna be here with me for a bit. We've got a few conversations we're gonna have about a bunch of different things. So you can follow along, you can check out the playlist, click on that video, and we'll see you there.